glad that you could join us tonight. It's almost straight up seven o'clock and uh, looking forward to share some, sharing some thoughts with you tonight. Um, we're, we're looking at some things that uh, were left over from my, from my sermon last Sunday. Last Sunday, we talked about the, uh, the, the topic of uh, making laws that God didn't make. And uh, I, uh, I began by talking about uh, the question, how could one question be answered completely opposite in two opposite ways uh, in, in the Bible? And the question I referred to was um, dealing with the idea of circumcision. Um, the Bible tells us that in, uh, in Acts 16, 1 through 5, that Paul required Timothy to be circumcised. And Galatians 2, 3 through 4 tells us that he refused to allow Titus to be circumcised. Both of these young guys were younger ministers that were uh, being mentored by Paul. Both of them were being sent to do things, to, to finish up some things that, that God had done uh, for, through, through Paul. For example, uh, Timothy wound up in Ephesus for a while and Titus wound up on the island of Crete. In both places, they were supposed to establish elders and set things in order after Paul had left on to do other things. Um, but interestingly, uh, the question that came up was, should a, uh, should a Christian be a Jew first before they can become a Christian? Should a, a Jewish, uh, Jewish man be, or should a, a Gentile man be circumcised like a Jew before they become a Christian? And uh, interestingly, Paul said, yes, Timothy, you need to be, be circumcised. And, uh, and uh, for Titus, he refused to allow them to do that. And, uh, and so the question came up to me, or it came up to my head as the first time I studied this, is what's, what's going on here? How could, how could the same question have diametrically opposed answers uh, in the text of Scripture and uh, in the teachings of, of, of an apostle? And... Uh, um, the answer is that uh, the context of the two was different. And the context that made the, 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 the question different for Timothy and Titus was uh, the presence of people who called themselves Christians, who were members of the, of, the, of the first century church, who were making laws that God didn't make. And in the making of those laws, they created a different set of circumstances for uh, one particular group of Christians than they did for another. And because of those circumstances that they created, uh, Paul had different answers for the same question in those in those different places. And uh, so we talked Sunday about how that this was a, a historical thing. We don't argue today about uh, whether somebody has to be circumcised or uncircumcised to be part of a church. Um, in fact, as I told the people Sunday today, especially with uh, the COVID virus and other things, we've got. Uh, every other urinal being marked off as not usable in men's room. Whereas in the first century, the way you proved whether you belonged or not was you went to the restroom together and you took a peek. We don't understand that. We don't do that. We don't do it that way today. Um, but that's how they did it. That's how they did it. And so it was easy on the front end to talk about this discussion, this argument in the first century, because we, we don't have any skin in this game. We don't, uh, we don't, argue about this and so it's it's just a historical oddity or a, a historical curiosity for us to look at the question about uh, circumcision in the first century and yet my claim is that this is an illustration of something that goes a whole lot deeper and that something that is is a, a part of human nature and a part of church life even today and uh, so I'd like to give you a, a, a few different different examples of today where um, People begin with what the Bible teaches, and because they want to help others be more godly, or they want to make themselves look better, or 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 there's lots of different ways we could say or, uh, they wind up making rules that God didn't make. Let's begin in uh, Romans chapter 16, starting verse 17. Paul says about th this situation where there are people who are making rules and laws that God didn't make. They're adding to the word of God and what they expect people in their fellowship to do. Paul says, beginning in verse 17 of Romans 16, I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and who put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. 
But I, Paul say, speaking, want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. And by context, what Paul says here is that uh, these people who are adding to the word of God, who are stretching and, uh, and what they maybe think of as strengthening uh, the, the, the rules that go with the lifestyle of a believer, um, Paul saying, no, this is, this is not good. It's, it's, it's evil. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're, if you're trying to be a good Christian, you stay away from people like this and uh, you don't let them, them suck you in. And, and, uh, we saw, like I said, when we studied through the book of Acts uh, and Romans, uh, on Sunday, we saw how that these people, these kinds of people really caused huge, huge problems. And it became such a problem that these people opposed Paul. They, uh, they, some of them even swore to not eat, uh, until he was dead. Uh, some of them followed him from city to city, causing all kinds of huge problems. And uh, all of it was because they wanted what they wanted. And they wanted the Apostle Paul to agree with them and to uh, do his own version of changing the word of God. And Paul refused to do that. And it cost him dearly. And there were churches that had huge, huge problems because of this. So somebody says, well, Rick, why are we talking about this? We don't, we don't argue about cruci- uh, uh, circumcision today. And, then, and I would say, yes, that's true. We don't argue about that today. But there are other things we argue about, and the arguments themselves have their roots in, do we let the Bible say what the Bible says? Or do we think that we need to help God and help other people by adding uh, more uh, fences, more uh, guardrails to the highway to keep people from going uh, across a ditch? Let's, let's talk about a couple of these. Um, here's an example. Uh, let's begin with what God says. In this example, I'm, I'm, I'm using the, uh, the, the idea of, of what the Bible says the purpose of the church is and the focus of the church and what the primary function of the church should be. Here's what God says through Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we see here that in this great commission that Jesus gave his disciples, and by extension to you and me, uh, you, could, you could say that the purpose of the church it could, could, could be called a great commission sandwich. And the great commission sandwich is you teach, you baptize, and you teach. And the purpose of all of this sandwich is to help people observe all the things that that Jesus has commanded, uh, help people become disciples of of God. And who are we to do this with? It's to be all nations. The Greek phrase there is ta ethne, all ethnic groups. Uh, We're to do that with the people that are like us. We're to do that with people that, that are not like us. We're to do that with people who speak our language. We're supposed to find ways to reach people who don't speak our language. Uh, but even the idea of ethnic groups in, in, uh, in um, American cities today, you find people that, who come from different backgrounds. There's, there's uh, Hispanic Americans, and there's French Americans, and there's German Americans, and there's uh, Irish Americans, and there's uh, motorcycle riding Americans, and there's mechanic Americans, and there's military Americans, and there's pro-law enforcement Americans, and anti-law enforcement Americans. And so according to the Great Commission, who are we to take the gospel to? Ta, ethne, all ethnic groups. The people you like, the people you don't. The people you're comfortable with, the people that you're not. That's what God, through Jesus, says the purpose of the church and the purpose of being a disciple of Jesus is. Now, where do we find people in our our day-to-day? Where do we find people who are trying to make rules that God didn't make? Um, You find it in a church sometimes when someone will say, well, you know, I've been a member of this church a long time, and uh, this is what I think we need to do, and since I've been here so long, you need to do what I'm telling you to do. Or there'll be other people sometimes who say, well, you know, um, there's a lot of people who agree with me about this. We all think that the, that, that, uh, the church ought to be doing this, or the church ought to be doing that. And most of the time when they say those kind of things, what they mean is you ought to be doing something that they want to cater to them, to make them happy, uh, to fulfill their goals, uh, to make them look good, all those kinds of things. And that is not the biblical purpose of the church. 
Jesus said the purpose of the church is to go into all the world. And so when we say something along those lines, here's another way that we can say it. Um, it's uh, I don't remember the uh, I don't remember the exact that exact percentages right now, but a very large percentage of what a lot of churches call church growth is not church growth. Um, many times, people who have of, of, of a like denomination, say for example, uh, churches of Christ or Baptist or wherever, whoever you want to talk about, they'll say that their church is growing. What they mean is they're stealing brick from other church buildings that have a similar sign to ours, and. It, that's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of, of a church, the purpose of a particular congregation, according to Jesus, is to go into the world and teach the gospel to everybody. It's not to go to other churches and convince other churches who, who believe the same and do the same and act the same to uh, convince their people to come to our church because our church is better than their church. No. no. The purpose is not to figure out whose church is the better church. The purpose is to be a disciple of Jesus and follow him. And to take the Great Commission into the, all the world, to take the gospel into all the world. But we set aside sometimes the law of God because this is what we want. And we think this would be an easier way. And we think we could make a bigger showing this way. And, and it would make us look better and make our numbers look better and make our particular group of people look better because we convinced all these other people that, that we're a better group than that group. Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So in a re very real sense, church growth, according to God, is not getting someone from one church to go to another church, especially within the same fellowships. Church growth is bringing outside people who don't go to church anywhere into your church, and now they become a disciple of Jesus. That's church growth. That's the purpose of the church. But sometimes we set aside the rules of God for what we want. Um, and I'm telling you, it's not a good thing. It very seldom works out well. It almost always uh, in the long run, uh, doesn't look pretty and it doesn't wind up well. Here's a here's another example. Um, let's look at uh, what God says in some places about how we should uh, train and discipline our children. Here's what God says in 2 Samuel 7 verse 14. God says, I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men and with floggings inflicted by men. Here God's talking about uh, leaders of his people and leaders in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the group. He's talking about, about grown men, and, but he's, he's saying that, that this is what I think a father does with a son. Um, when he does wrong, God says, as a father, I will, I will punish him. Um, Proverbs 3, 12, the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. God says, if you love your children, if you love your children, you will discipline them. Um, Proverbs 13, verse 24, just about anybody can quote it. People argue about it off right and left, whether it's good, whether it's not, whether it was only good for the, for the Old Testament when this was written. Here's what the wise man says. He who spares the rod hates his son. He who loves him is careful to discipline him. Uh, Proverbs 19, 18 says, discipline your son. For in that there is hope. Don't be a willing party to his death. Now, that's what God says. God says that when we love our children and love our grandchildren, that the, one of the ways we prove that and one of the ways we show that and one of the things that we'll do if we're wise is we will teach them and we will discipline them and sometimes we will punish them. Now, let me be quick to say when I'm talking about discipline and fun punishment, I'm not talking about broken bones. I'm not talking about child abuse. I'm not talking about things that uh, require stitches at the emergency room because we lost our temper and we beat them too severely. That's not what God means either. Uh, when God says that he was going to discipline this leader uh, of the nation as his son, uh, he gives no idea that the, at the end of this, the guy was going to have to go to the hospital and be under uh, convalescent care for a year before he could come back to go to work. No. Uh, what, what God implies is that uh, when God finished punishing him, he would still be able to do his job. We're not talking about uh, abuse or things that we that, that are clearly wrong in people's family. And yet we've got people today who look at those kinds of things and they say, well, because there's a dad across town or there's a dad uh, of, of one of my kids, one of the kids on my son or grandson's baseball teams, that since he, uh, since he uh, goes too far and is too harsh and too... Uh, 
too controlling in his discipline. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be that kind of a father. I don't want to be that kind of a grandfather. So I'm just going to let my kids do anything they want to do. It's a mistake. God clearly says there's a time and a place for training and disciplining children. And there's nothing good uh, uh, in the eyes of a child about being disciplined until they get a little older and look back and they think, wow, my life is so much better today. Because you see, it's the children that are that are taught self-control. It's the children that are thought, shot, taught to be respectful. It's the t- children that are taught to do what they're supposed to do. Um, my wife, Tammy, teaches uh, special ed students and uh, most recently taught kindergarten students. And I love what she had to say a couple of different times when she says, the first thing you've got to teach children is the puppy rules. You've got to teach them the puppy rules. You've got to teach them to come when I say come, to stop when I say stop, to sit when I say sit, to come when I call you, to understand that no means no and yes means yes. And when I say get down, I mean for you to get down and quit scratching somebody's leg. And it's kind of a humorous way to think about it, but think about all the children who don't get what they need from teachers. Don't get what they dip, get, need from community leaders. Don't get what they need from churches or from coaches or later on in life from bosses or from college professors because they were never taught. They were never disciplined. They were allowed to do what they wanted the way they wanted, and they finally get old enough where they're in a part of life where that just doesn't fly. Uh, you can't do just anything you want to do in a uh, judge's courtroom. If a police officer pulls a gun and tells you to stop, you can't just keep running around and punch him in the nose because that's what you want to do. There are fences. There are boundaries. There are things that we need to teach our children. And so the wise man Solomon says, don't be a party to your child's death. Don't refuse to do the hard thing about disciplining them because that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. Children that are not taught to control themselves, that are not taught that a certain kind of activity is perfectly appropriate at a ball game, and that same activity is not appropriate at a funeral. You don't act in church the way you act uh, in a bowling alley. And children who don't learn those things, they, they go through the rest of their life handicapped. It's not a physical handicap, but it is a handicap. And so if we're not careful, uh, we wind up sometimes, and I've heard this within, within churches that I've worked with, uh, I've actually heard Christian parents say, well, my child would never do something so wrong that I would need to punish them. Don't kid yourself. Um, <laughs> I know my kids, and I know me, and I know that my kids are all chips off the old block. And there's nothing you could tell me that my kids made a mistake and did that I would say, oh, they'd never do that. Listen, my kids could do anything. And the reason for that is because there's times in my life that I was stupid enough that I could have done anything. And just to and to, and to say, well, I'm going to take my child's side, right or wrong, they're my child, and the teacher must be, uh, must be abusing them. The, uh, the police officer must be abusing them. Maybe the teacher is. Maybe the police officer is. But we still have a responsibility before God within our families and with those that are within our authority. We will answer for the way we have either taught and disciplined our children or didn't. And changing God's rules doesn't make that change. It doesn't make that change. And it doesn't matter if somebody says that disciplining a child or swatting a child's hand is the same as child abuse. I know that it's not. If you think about it, you'll know that you're not. Uh, But just because somebody says that, so what? So what? Um, I can't remember which one it was, but one of my kids came home from school one time, and uh, they had been taught at school that, you know, if if your parents are too mean to you, you can call the police and have them arrested. You can call child services and they can, they can make them stop that. And which are one of my children. It was all my, it could have been any of them because they're, they're all, uh, they're all stubborn in their own ways. Whichever one it was came, came home one day and said, uh, uh, you can't tell me no, cause I can call the police and have you arrested. Now stop and pause the videotape right there for a minute. I have heard many parents through the years who, when they had a child or a teacher, uh, challenge them in that way that they 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 just uh lowered their head and said well, well okay I can't go to jail I can't do this I can't do that I guess you can just do whatever you want to do and the child gets this 
I showed you look, and they're headed down the path to destruction. So go back to the story with my with my child. The, the, the child told me that, whichever one it was, and I pulled the phone off the wall. This was before we had cell phones, and I handed them the phone, and I said, do it. They said, well, aren't you worried? And I've told them and I've told others many times before, I'm willing to go to jail for the good of my kids. How about you? Now, why would I say that? Because I know that if I base my life on the word of God, I'm going to be okay. And if God says that the best thing is for me to teach and discipline my children, to teach and discipline my grandchildren, to hold them to a standard of authority and to help hold them to a standard of, of, of law and order within my sphere. If God tells me to do that, I need to do that. And whatever price I have to pay, then that's the price that I have to pay if I love them and if I love God who gives me that, that command. Um, I've heard other parents say, well, you know, I, I don't want to hurt their self-esteem. I don't, I don't want to stifle their creativity. Listen, there's some things about my kids that I needed to stifle their creativity. They didn't need to be any more creative about getting into trouble. They didn't need to be any more creative about uh, uh, misusing some of their toys or tearing up some of my tools or uh, as they got TB teenagers wrecking my cars. They don't, they, they didn't need any more creativity about that. Um, and what is the value of self-esteem if it's all hot air and if everybody around you can see that you're living the the the, the real life um, um, the, 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 the real life role of the emperor who has no clothes if you haven't don't remember that story from your children and grandchildren go back and read about the emperor who had no clothes uh, listen we we need to obey god and if god says this is what we need to do we don't need to allow ourselves or other people set aside the rules of God and make our own rules and say, well, that's okay. One last way that we don't need to let ourselves or others set aside the rules of God with this is when God says to discipline our, 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 our punish our children, it's supposed to be for their good. And so we can't say, well, they made me so angry that I just lost control of myself. That's no excuse for child abuse. That's no excuse. Why? Because the discipline and punishment that God designs, when God punishes and disciplines us, it's for our good. And the goal is for those of us who are followers of Christ to extend that to our children and grandchildren too. We shouldn't just punish our children because we're angry. We shouldn't just uh, uh, be harsh with them because we've had a long day and they're the fifth person to get on our last nerve. That's not what it's about. And so we shouldn't set, make those kind of laws either that say, well, my kids shouldn't have made me so mad or I wouldn't have hurt them that badly. No, 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 no. We need to do things God's way, the way God says to do them. And we don't need to make ourselves or anybody else excuses by the laws that we make that God didn't make. Here's another example I want us to talk about while I'm, talk, while I'm uh, stepping on people's toes. I need to go ahead and step on my own as well. Here's what God says about husbands and wives. In Colossians 3.19, God says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And in my translation, there's a period. Which means that's the end of the thought. There is no if and but. There are no extenuating circumstances. There's a period there. And there's there for a reason. In 1 Peter 3, 1, Peter says, Wives, be, submission, be submissive to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Now, what does God say? God tells husbands, you don't be, you don't, you don't be harsh with your wives. You want the harsh with the wives. And if you ask, ask the question, well, why? Uh, Peter says that we're to treat uh, we're to treat our wives like a like a uh, uh, a special weaker vessel. If you've got um, some some people have noticed the uh, the coffee mugs behind me on my, the top of my shelf where I collect coffee mugs. And if you're to look at some of the coffee mugs, some of them are very delicate. Some of them are made very thin. They're made out of beautiful kinds of things. Some of them are just um, pottery mugs that you can toss on the dash of a pickup truck and throw into a microwave, and it's, it's okay. The idea uh, from Peter is that 
uh, one of the differences between men and women is that men are like <laughs> mud, mud ceramic cups and women are like fine bone china. And you don't just throw uh, fine filigreed china with uh, gold leaf on the edges of the, the cup. You don't just throw that into the dash of your work truck because it's more valuable than that and it's easily broken and you can quickly and easily destroy the value of it. Uh, save that kind of behavior for the plastic mug or the uh, the tumbler or whatever else. Uh, the same thing is true in, 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 our, in our lives, guys. God says, don't be harsh with your wives. Um, I try my best to not be harsh with my wife, and yet my best sometimes is not good enough, and I, and I still am. And so when that happens, when I fail to live up to the, the standards that God has set for me, I have a choice. I can either excuse myself and make laws or rules that God didn't make and say, well, it's her own fault. She shouldn't have made me so mad, or she should have known better, or she shouldn't have, she shouldn't have done that, or she should have done that, or she should have done it this way or not done it that way. Um, Listen, making rules that God didn't make doesn't help. God's rule for husbands is you don't treat your wives harshly. You treat them well. You treat them with respect and with dignity. If for no other reason, simply because God made them. And uh, God doesn't make junk. The stuff that he makes is beautiful and wonderful and valuable. And by mistreating something that God has made and has given to you in the form of a blessing, you're basically saying that you do not appreciate the thing that God has worked so hard to give you and bless you with. And so God's rule is don't be harsh with your wife. And wives, it's the same kind of thing. I've, I've talked to women through the years whose husbands were not Christians, and they wanted them to be Christians so, bad, so badly. And you talk to them about, well, what have you done to try and, and, and bring them to the Lord? And they start telling you all the times they've nagged him and, 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 and berated him and made him look bad in public because he didn't do uh, what they wanted him to do religiously. And that's exactly the opposite of what Peter said to do. Peter said, if you've got an unbelieving husband, the way you lead him to the Lord is without words, which women don't want to hear. <laughs> women don't want to hear. Uh, there's times that Tammy will come to me and she'll start talking about something that's bothering her. And, and my, first, uh, my first impression is I need to help her fix this. And sometimes she does need help fixing that. But nine times out of 10, she doesn't want me to fix anything. She just wants me to listen. She just wants me to listen. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, estimated that women use sometimes two, uh, three, four times as many words in a day as men do. And so by the time men get home from work, they've used all their words. And um, women still want to talk because they've got a bunch of words they haven't used yet. Um, and yet, there are times where God says, look, ladies, you're not going to get what you want by nagging him. You're not going to get what you want by making him look bad. You're not going to get what you want by trying to back him in a corner and force him to do what you want him to do. No, the word of God says, uh, the word of God says that wives are be submissive, submissive to their husbands. And we live in a world today where that's not what we want to hear, especially because we redefine the word submissive. We hear the word submissive and we think less valuable. No, that has nothing to do with submissive. Some other people hear the word submissive and they think, oh, well, I can, he, can just, uh, he can just be the king and i got to be the, the servant. No, it has nothing to do with that either. It has everything to do with our attitude and the way we treat each other and how respectful we are or not. Um, the thing that makes, means the most to most women is love and affection. The thing that means the most to a man is whether you respect them or not and whether you show them that respect. And if you don't show them that respect it doesn't really matter what you want because they get stubborn. They're like, they're like old donkeys. They'll lay their ears back and they'll just dig their heels in and you can tug and, and shove and, and you can cry and you can plead. It's not going to do what you want it to do. And just making the extra rules and said, well, you know, he knows better. Why didn't he do better? And I, I told him and told him and told him and he won't listen to me. It doesn't help to make rules and laws that God didn't make. God says, this is the way you do things. This is the way you do things. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean, uh, being submissive doesn't mean being a second-class citizen. Uh, treating your wife kindly doesn't mean being a second-class citizen. It doesn't mean that uh, you're worth less or worth more. In fact, you, 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 in the long run, prove yourself to be worth more if you do things God's way, even if it doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Even if it seems like it's easier 
to make new rules and new laws that make, oh, well, I'm, I'm right. I don't need to change anything. It's them that needs to change. No, that's not the way that the kingdom of God works. It's not the way that the kingdom of God works. And so we could go on and on and on. There's thousands of these examples where uh, God gives us commands. He gives us advice. He gives us examples. And uh, there's literally thousands of examples where we can choose to make up our own and say, well, no, uh, I, I want to do it this way. Or I think it would be better if we do it this way. Um, and historically, they change from time to time. The churches that I grew up in, the hot buttons were, uh, can a woman wear anything besides a dress? And uh, can a man have hair that touches his collar and his ears? And uh, can you be pleasing to God if you go to church without a coat and tie? And and all those kind of things. And for most churches today, those aren't the hot buttons anymore, but there's some others. And, and as time moves on, the principles stay the same. We need to let God's word be God's word. And in the areas where we think God didn't go far enough or he didn't explain it enough, we need, to think, we need to think twice and three and four times about stepping into those shoes saying that God needs our help uh, to make this more plain and to make people better servants of his. God's word is God's word. We have no right to set aside his commands. And we have no right to introduce commands of our own and tell people they've got to live up to our standards. Nobody has to live up to my standards. We all have God's standards to live up to. And in the areas where God has set a standard, we need to do our best. And when our best is not good enough, we need to trust in mercy and grace and the blood of Jesus. And in the areas where God has given us freedom, we need to love God and trust each other enough to give each other those same freedoms, even though it's not what we want and it doesn't feel good to us. We need to let God be God. We need to allow his children to be his children. And we need to remember that we are one of his children. We are not one of his bosses. And it doesn't matter what our age is, what our education, how long we've been a member of a church. We don't have the right to set aside the rules of God. And we don't have the right to make rules that he didn't make. So if hopeful thoughts are helpful to you. I'm sure there's people that disagree with me. As I always try to say, listen, you can disagree with me. We can still be friends. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, odds are, if I'm not wrong tonight, I will be some other time. Uh, but that's also true for you, right? So let's take a look over here. Uh, let me look back and see who's, who's, uh, who's been with us tonight. I see uh, Dave Snyder and uh, Cheryl are with us. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Glad you could join us. Uh, who else is over here? Uh, Let's see. Uh, see, I'm not sure I'm getting the same list. Tammy says, hi, Ron, and hi, Tiffany, but I haven't seen their name. Yeah, there's Ron. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Brenda from Mississippi is with us. Hi, uh, hi, Donna Shaw. I'm glad your things are going well for you back home. There's Tiffany's name. Hi, Tiffany. Glad you could be with us. Uh, what's that? Jatura. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. Hi, Jatura. It's good to see you. Glad you could be with us, too. Uh, who else am I missing here? Uh, there's Roy. Hey, Roy. Good to see you, man. Um, let's see. Uh, John Sue, glad you could join us. Um, Patty, glad you could join us. Glad you could be with us. Uh, of course, Tammy's with us. Uh, uh, Marilyn and Gary Johnston are, are, are watching from their house. And, uh, oh, there's, there's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Glad you could join us. I'm sure, I'm sure there's some others. The way this works, of course, is you can see me, but I can't see you. And uh, if, if you didn't uh, write something into the text line, then I don't know that you're here. Thank you for joining us. We've spent our 30 minutes tonight. Hope that, uh, if nothing else, our thoughts tonight have made you scratch your head a little bit, go back to your Bible some more, spend some more time in prayer and in thought. Because the God we serve is a great God. And the word he's given us is so very valuable and so very helpful. And we do have better lives the closer we live to the way he wants us to live and the things that he's taught us. And uh, that includes the freedom that comes. And so I'm glad uh, today for the freedom that you and I have. I'm glad for the uh, commands that you and I have. And uh, uh, so give this some thought and give it some prayer in your own personal life. Uh, Lord willing, we'll do this again next week. And uh, thank you for being with us.